Okay, we are getting started here. Welcome everyone to the Fantasia Film Festival's post-screening Q&A with the cast and crew of the feature film Unearth and the star and director of the short film De Book. I am Erica Berlin, the executive director of the Film Society of Northwestern Pennsylvania, and it is my pleasure to host this panel this afternoon. Um, so Unearth, Unearth follows two neighboring farm families whose relationships are strained when one of them chooses to lease their land to an oil and gas company. In the midst of growing tension, the land is drilled and something long dormant and terrifying deep beneath the earth's surface is released. And the book is a, I wrote this part, the slightly mystical story of a pious modern day exorcist, Dan, that brings together a group of Jewish men to rid a possessed man of an <clears throat> evil spirit by performing a tedious ceremony. Um, you know, I improvised that from what I read on the internet, <laughs> I hope you don't mind. So well, anyway, did I do a good job? I, I no, you did, it was perfect. Uh, okay, so and some DJ folks, um, well, remember everyone, some folks that are joining us have yet to see both of these films, so we're going to avoid spoilers at all costs. Uh, with me today is John C. Lyons, co-director and co-writer and co-producer of Unearth. He's also the director of programming for the Film Society. PJ Marshall, who plays Tom Dolan in Unearth. Monica Wyke, Aubrey Dolan, and Brooke Sorensen, who plays Kim Lomack. And also joining us is Diane Walid, the director and writer of the book, the short film that was programmed with Unearth. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't we see the people that are watching us? No. <laughs> no, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Hi, all people that are watching. Thank you for joining us. So uh, let's start with you, Diane. You're originally from Israel, is that correct? And now you live in Paris. I was born and... in France and I moved oh, born to in Israel France. when I was 11 and then I came back. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So while you were there, you had some military service. Um, how did that experience influence you as a filmmaker? Ooh. Uh, a lot, actually. Well, it wasn't the most fun experience, <laughs> but um, it made me the man I am today. So I guess yeah. it helped. And also in the book, there is kind of a, a um, a military point of view in some parts of it when they prepare themselves it looks like they're going to war and stuff like that so I guess yes. that's how maybe it had some impact on the film yeah that was great so okay so Paris you have your film roots there um, Erie is actually starting to I don't know trying to build up a film industry here so when you're when you're working on building up a, a school, a film collective, as you have, what kind of advice would you give to a smallish town like Erie? Um, well, understand that, um, uh, okay, the first thing that I understood when I arrived in Paris, I was just coming from Israel, uh, back to a country that I knew when I was 11 years old. So it, it was like a whole entire new country. I had to relearn a little bit the language. So it was hard, but everybody at school used to tell us that we have to uh, make connections as much as possible with people from the industry. And me and my associates, the one that we build a collective with, um, we understood very soon that our connections are already around us. We don't know yet how to do, but we will all learn and we will make movies tomorrow. So our connections are already around us. So if I could give one advice is to just work with the people that are already around you. Great advice. I think we're doing a pretty good job at that. So, all right, uh -huh. let's talk about the book. All right, how has the festival experience been for you so far? Great, marvelous, it was great. We had the chance to participate in the biggest festival in France. First of all, uh, the first, um, we had a lot of festivals. Uh, uh, PIF, that is a French festival that specialize in genre movies. Uh, Gérard Armé that also specialize in that kind of films that we had the chance to win and it's one of the, the biggest and it was a, really a dream for us, for, for me and for all my team. And we participate to Clermont-Ferrand also, which is a huge, uh, huge uh, um, short film festival. So 
really good so far. And Fantasia, phew, that was unbelievable. And what do you think is, how, how has the virtual experience been? It sucks. <laughs> bad it sucks bad we have no interaction with the people me and john are trying on the discord uh, app but it's really lame it's lame and all especially because i had the experience of so many festivals live you know so you get to talk to the people you get to meet them you get to meet other directors and 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 i don't know get drunk and and talk yeah. about movies until the end of night and it was it was great so and the virtual experience is weird. This is the first time I see faces and I'm really happy about it. That's why I wanted to see the faces of everybody. But, uh, but uh, yeah, it sucks that it's virtual. But thank God that exists so we can keep on doing this and, and right. share as much as we can. All right. So in the book, you have um, an exorcist, basically. Dan plays... Um, a man who goes to see his friend whose wife is possessed, I guess. And uh, he says, I'll come back in seven days and I'll, I'll figure this out. So he pulls together a group of men and they go perform this, um, this group exorcism. That's the best way I can describe it. And it was so fascinating because it was such a ritualistic um, performance by these actors. Like you said, almost like going into war where they come in, performing the the uh, traditional um you know the traditional kiss and the touching of the what do you call the thing by the door with it's the prayer wrapped the, up inside mezuzah. yes and it was just fascinating to watch that and um talk about what that meant to you as you know as a jew and and making a film that was so strongly about jewish ritual and tradition what makes you believe i'm a jew is it the nose <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, the thing is, I'm a, I'm a real fan of exorcism movies. And um, as a Jew, I grew up in a very uh, orthodox family. And uh, as I grew up, I, I wanted something that I could connect with a little more. So I started to, to, to learn about it and to read about it more and more. And at some point, I understood how how perfect it was for a movie, how interesting it was because the ritual is so different than what we used to and, and what we usually watch. So <clears throat> I started to understand how precise and how different was this ritual. For example, as you said, you, um, uh, in, in the Jewish tradition for um, uh, a prayer to be validated, you need to be 10 men. It's called a minyan. So that's one of the of the um, obligations that you have and also the shofar and uh, all this folklore that was around it was to me very touching, very beautiful. I grew up with it, it's, it's part of my identity. And, um, and uh, as soon as I understood, I knew that exorcism was something that was part of uh, all the, um, uh, the three monotheist religions. So, I started to, to look around, to check. It was kind of difficult because the, the Jews are pretty secretive about these things. Uh, so it was complicated. I had to read a lot of uh, special books and uh, ask questions on forums uh, and, and, and ask from uh, rabbis and stuff like that. So a lot, a lot of research. And, um, and, um, and, as, and, and as, as a Jew, to answer your question, it moved me because this is something that I wanted to, to watch as a, as a viewer at first, you know, just as a, as, a, as a guy who loves movies. So you directed the film and you also star in it. So what yeah. was that like to, to do both? <laughs> you didn't Great. have enough challenges. <laughs> yeah. I, by the way, I produced it also. Oh, okay. And I was doing the makeup and I was the sound engineer. And also, no, I'm kidding. But, uh, <laughs> but um, the thing is, I have the greatest team in the world. Um, the key for me was to have the right team around me, people that I trust, people that uh, know what they're talking about, that love the film, love the script, you know, and know what are my true intentions so they could really guide me through my, dire through my direction. Also, I had a great cast and it was 
really easy to direct them. I just had to 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 let them lead and and answer as as an actor because I'm not trying I'm trying as much as possible not to act in the film. I wanted to in French it's called uh, non jeu non acting. Uh, so that's what I tried. But uh, yeah, the key was having a great team around me that 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 understands the film and that is very professional and was able to guide me as much as possible through the process and a great cast that were just uh, very supportive and understanding because I'm not an actor. I don't have a, I, I, I didn't study it or anything. So that was, uh, but yeah, that was crazy. I actually have very few memories of the, of the shooting itself. <laughs> it, it was really crazy. You were so into your character. I mean, I'm curious so, about the character of Dan and what, inspired him to become this this kind of mystical figure um <laughs> well well it's not that kind was of he game. possessed before <laughs> okay so uh um right now i am working on uh, uh, a longer version of it i was hoping uh, you would say that <laughs> this is the first time i say it publicly but uh, I'm working on it right now, so I'm in the writing process. But um, no, he wasn't possessed. A lot of stuff happened to him that is terrible, and you will have to watch the future for that. All right. Well, we look forward to that. So, so do I. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> Thanks. I will need that. <laughs> I will look for 10 men that will help me. Oh, you'll find them, I'm sure. Um, okay, so let's kind of talk about Unearth, but I'm going to ask you, how, why do you think that the films were programmed together? Why do you think your film was programmed with Unearth? I think the key, the key word is uh, slow burn. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. I think that's the main reason. The fact, um, also the, 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 the uh, community's aspect of it, but I think the fact that it takes its time to bring you somewhere. It takes its time to, to bring you into um, come on, you know, ambiance, um, into a universe, you know, into something very uh, particular, and all and everything blows up in your face at the end. So I think yeah, the slow burn is a, is a, is the right word for it. Mm -hmm. Maybe John has a as a yeah, John. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think I yeah I, I kind of agree with um, what Diane just said. Uh, I feel like yeah we're uh, we kind of break the mold these these two films. You know some uh, some horror fans they just want to get to the scares and um, but these films take time. You know you're you're a rule breaker by making a, a long short film for sure. Uh, it's, it's hard for programmers to program. So that speaks to the quality of your film that you're making so Thanks. many festivals. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's, um, and I, I felt it in on earth, there is kind of an, an auteur dimension to it. You, you see, that's what I tried with, uh, with, with my short, I tried to, um, uh, make the universe of it as realistic as possible so and i feel that there is this um intention in in, in on earth so i don't know it, 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 they work great together i think yeah strangely they do these programmers yeah. at fantasia they know what they're doing that's yeah. great are they listening right now i don't know <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? all right well Diane, thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, I hope you stick around for the thank Unearth you. discussion. And uh, so let's move into the, the Unearth conversation. Uh, thank you all, the cast of Unearth, for being here. And uh, Monica, why don't we start with you? So it was a really quick 18-day shoot, um, as in the case with a lot of independent films. So what was it like working on such a short schedule? Had you done an imp independent film before Unearth? You'll have to unmute Monica and Brooke. Oh, I'm sorry, Monica. <laughs> no worries. There we go. Time. Hey, there you go. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, I had an amazing time. Um, I I'd worked on some independent films before, but not um, not 
in a role that was more than just a couple of days at a time. Um, or it was a short and, you know, the whole shoot lasted three or four days. Um, so this was the first time that I'd worked on something for, I know it, it was a fast shoot, but for me it was like, oh, this is a long time because I'd done a, you know, done a fair amount of television where it's just like a day here, a couple of days there. And, and it wasn't consist it wasn't one day after another after another after another um so i learned so much uh, i learned so much about myself <laughs> i learned um i just i learned so much just about um the process and it was it was fantastic like to this day i know it's been two years since we shot it but to this day i've just have been so grateful for to john and dorota for giving me the opportunity to to play aubrey um uh she gets to do a lot of things. I can't spoil anything, but I had a lot of, of, of um, opportunity to try on different feelings. <laughs> That's great. I mean, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your character, Aubrey? Um, there was a lot of really interesting commentary from, from folks after seeing the film. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to hear what you have to say about your character and then I'll... I'll ask you about that. Aubrey is um, the mom of Christina, who's the you know the lead, and one of one of the leads. And um, uh, Aubrey's married to PJ's character. There's PJ down there, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, I think that she you know there's a scene where she says where she talks about what she thought she might have done with her life, and she didn't get to do that. And I think that Aubrey is just stuck in a life that maybe she didn't expect to have. And she's fine with it. She wouldn't make any waves about it. You know, she's not bitter about it. But I think that there's a, a sadness to Aubrey. I think that there's a pride in her, uh, the way she cares for her family. Um, she's a hard worker and I think she's very nurturing. Um, that's what I will say. <laughs> she can be too nurturing in some situations. Uh-huh, sure. Well, I mean, okay, so right, Brooke? <laughs> her family's situation. Oh, Brooke, you're, you're muted yeah. too. Hold on. There you go. Yay. Yes, very nurturing. I agree. Very nurturing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, regarding the family situation, so we're talking about two families who are both kind of struggling in rural America and trying to make their way when life, you know, life in, in as farmers hasn't really gone very well. And especially with Aubrey, you know, with her family's situation, mm -hmm. everyone starts to get a little bit sick in their own way and, and mm -hmm. Aubrey in particular. So what can you say about the economic situation where a woman who's starting to get sick doesn't go to a doctor? Oh, well, that's, that's out of the question for a number of reasons. She doesn't go to a doctor because they can't afford it time-wise and financially. Mm -hmm. She's got work to do. And mm -hmm. her husband says that, you know, over and over again, like work, we have, we have to bring in this crop we have to go out in the field we have to we have to do this this work and it's it's not a, it's, there's no choice you know mm -hmm. she can't take a day off um uh no no one can take a day off uh there's there's nobody else there to pick up the slack mm -hmm. and it's a real luxury to you know it's a real luxury to be able to have a sick day it's a real luxury to be able to to rest and heal and you know, Aubrey's a, a fictional character, but um, I, I, I think it's a very, very real um, situation that, that so many people are in, so many Americans are in, particularly right now. Yeah, and this question's for all of you. How was, it ex how was that experience to, to put yourselves in the shoes of, of a farming, farming families that are struggling, struggling economically? Um, working class, working class American families and, and some, some rural folks that are just so even separated from, you know, working class families, you know, I mean, John can speak to this because he grew up 
he grew up in Albion, uh, out in the country in Pennsylvania. So what was that like uh, for all of you to put yourself in those shoes? Um, I'll say that I feel like there was a process of like recognizing my own privileges and the thing, yeah. like, like you said, like going to the doctor, at, if I get a cut, like a bad cut or whatever it may be. So there's a process of like learning about myself and the way I've grown up and how, how um, I've had certain privileges that, that a lot of people don't have and find themselves in a desperate spot like the Lomax. So um, yeah, it's a very interesting and growth experiment, uh, growth experience. Yeah. DJ? Huh. Um, I would say I identify in the, in the way that you know, when you choose an actor's path, some, all of them have different experiences, but mine has always been a struggle for a long time. So like having insurance or having extra money to do anything was not really, you know, so I can identify <laughs> with that. And both my parents grew up, especially my mother, um, with nothing. So when I would hear stories about ways they got around things or dealt with things that most people had. Um, I, un I understand that. I understand choosing and doing things being poor than I'm more so than I understand the opposite. So it was just about taking that and learning the terrain of a farmer and, and putting it in that perspective. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. But um, and I think that's why I've been so afraid of success in a, in a lot of ways, because uh, the idea of having a lot of options and having money and having things scare, scares me because it's like, I don't, I don't understand that world. I don't, I always understand, you know, the other world struggling, you know, so I always identify with the, with the work, with stories, I always identify more so and I'm drawn to uh, struggle and people that yeah. are in class struggle because it's just what I know, what I grew up with in a lot of ways. I mean, I was more, um, I had it a little better than my brother and sister who are seven, eight years older than me, but I definitely, there was a time where my dad was uh, struggling like I've never seen and, you know, couldn't get out of bed and, 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 and living through that of like, not having a house full of furniture, which is, so I understand, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, and that does, go ahead. No, I, I... Um, So along those lines with you, uh, Brooke, this, this is clearly not your past, but, also uh, very connected, which you play a character who dropped out of high school and goes back after having a baby. And, you know, teen pregnancy um, certainly gets thrown into moral conversations, but how did that issue, how did the morality of that influence your character? Well, I think it's funny because I, I, I looked back at Kim's breakdown that I got for the audition and it said something about her um, not, not, not living in shame because of what happened and that she is a, she's a good girl. It doesn't take away like her innate goodness and, and, and want to be successful and all those sorts of things. And, and she, she doesn't let that stop her. Like she's, she goes back to high school. And I think there can be a lot of like shame, like socially too, that you have to really be a strong girl to, to deal with like in the school environment and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, it's interesting because it's mentioned even in the breakdown, how she, she doesn't let that put her in a corner of, of shame and feel guilty about it. And although her dad can't necessarily um, financially support her and her baby probably how she'd like, he's so supportive. I mean, taking care of, of Reese when I'm going to school. And so I think that's a, she, she's blessed in that aspect. All right, without spoiling anything, uh, <laughs> each of your characters go through a full range of emotions and you know each have their own really memorable 
gut-wrenching scenes. So, mm -hmm. you know, as actors, you know, what, what tips do you have for, um, for other actors that might be starting out and, you know, harnessing those emotions and controlling them even when it feels like your character or your scene is just spiraling out of control? I'll go. Um, you have to, I mean, you have to put all of your trust in your director for, for one thing. Um, you have to trust that, that they will tell you if, if you're on the right track, because if you're, if you're spending your energy second guessing yourself or, or critiquing yourself or trying to, to put something on, then you don't have that energy to feel the, the thing you need to feel. Um, one of the things that I was so, um, so grateful for and humbled by was, was the opportunity to, to play a role that had so many, um, so, such a journey and so, so many different, um, experiences and emotions. And it was a real catharsis in a lot of, a lot of days to be able to, let a lot of that out to be able to, you know, yell or scream or cry or, or laugh or, um, sing, you know, it, it <laughs> um, it, it was, it was, I was really grateful for that. And I think that most of my work, I mean, I've done a fair amount of theater, you know, where you get to do that kind of stuff every night, but, um, most of my work has, has, like I said before, hasn't spanned um, more than just a few days at a time. And so to be able to revisit this person, this character, day after day after day and carry her or have her carry me through all, all of these situations and all these feelings was, um, it was a really, uh, just a really great gift. Um, I'm a little emotional. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry Siri. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, John. Brooke or PJ? Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you're saying what advice? Yeah. Yeah, I lost track of that, of that thread, didn't I? I said, you have to listen. I said you have to listen to your director, and then I went on and just like talked about myself. <laughs> Y'all, Corona, I'm at home with a kid. It's thank you for letting me talk about myself. Well, I think that's what, um, you know, when you watch a movie and you grow up watching movies and you get attracted to them and you see emotional scenes so brilliantly, but when you're not there making them, it's very different. And when you've got uh, a crew of people around you and people talking and sometimes you have a nice crew, not so nice crew who doesn't care because some of the um, bigger shoots, the grips and those guys, they don't really, they don't care what you have to go through to put yourself into that emotional scene. So what Monica was saying about trusting your director, uh, you hope you have a director that creates an atmosphere where you feel, feel safe to risk, and he's right there with you. And if you talk to some of the greatest actors, they all say the same thing. Uh, uh, I, I strive when a director creates a space for me to risk. Mm -hmm. And John yeah. certainly did that, because there's one scene where I, was really nervous about because to me it was a very emotional scene. I knew I was going to be kind of burying myself and that never gets easy uh, or easier, but you just have to be brave. And as an actor, it's all about practice. The more opportunities you get to, to, uh, to act, you do it. I mean, I did so many short films. I think I have the longest short film list on IMDb because that's all I can get, but it doesn't change. You're in front of a camera, there's crew, and if, and I always had these great, somehow these great characters that were in great situations, but it was practice. And if yeah. you do that there, you just move up, it just gets more money and bigger, but it's the same concept. So the young actors, you just gotta go and, and do it and, and risk, 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 risk. Cause that's what it feels like. It feels naked. It doesn't feel good when you're that vulnerable, mm -hmm. but that's where the, you're putting yourself in the director's hands. And, and, but it's, it can be a bitch sometimes. <laughs> There's no question. But as far as the, the, the advice is get, 
in front, get a, do it wherever you can and, 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 and go for it every time because that's how you learn. So Brooke, you're, you're kind of at the beginning of your career. So do you take PJ's advice and, uh, and being so early in your career, what have you learned? Yeah, I mean, especially because I've come from a background of comedic television. This was so different for me and such a growth experience. And I remember getting my audition scene was my most emotional scene and like most gruesome emotional scene. That was my audition. Um, and I remember sitting in the waiting room and girl after girl going in and there's screams involved, I'll say that. Um, and, and you can hear and I was like, that's not gonna work for me. And I remember going out and just tr just telling myself there, I mean, I, I was definitely second guessing myself. I had never done any sort of scene of that level of emotion in an audition. And I, two words, braver, bravery and then trust like in myself and then, um, and just committing to it 110%. Like there was no room for me to be like, I just got rid of that oh, people are going to hear me and this and that. Mm -hmm. And what if I look crazy or, you know, all those little mm -hmm. insecurities, there's no room for it no. when, when you're doing that kind of emotional stuff, like just go for it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so it was, it was such a growth experience, experience for me. And I feel really grateful to, I don't always get an opportunity to play such a strong, complex, young woman I don't those opportunities don't always come and um I mean Kim's a young mom she's struggling like also a high school student all the things that we've talked about make for such a layered character and so much for me to explore so I mean a dream in that sense like I feel really grateful to have been trusted with her so yeah that's great and make no mistake Brooke it has, it has a hell of a career already <laughs> she's she's young but she's she's got a hell of a career right now <laughs> the indie world though this was like my first and just film um yeah. so yeah it was quite the experience and i'm very grateful for it that's great Can i Beautiful pop work. in and just I'm, I'm curious if uh diane has anything to add for acting <laughs> as an and i'm not an actor I'm oh I'm not, a, and I have no experience in it. I just, uh, I did, I did it in this one because it was the obvious choice. Choice, but <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to act. It's make believe to me. You know, I don't know. It, I, I, I. Well, you have, fooled me. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's great then, but uh, it's the the character is so. Um, I put, I I've put so much from me into the character. It was just really natural easy to me because uh, I didn't have really to work on it and I think I I, I should have but uh, I don't know it was the obvious choice and I we've tried we've tried to to actually cast someone but he had to be <coughs> uh, fat with a long hair and a beard and speaks perfect Hebrew and French and knows to blow the shofar so the, the 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 casting director she tells she told me well st stop stop shitting me and just do it yourself <laughs> not find this guy in paris so <laughs> that, that's how, that's pretty much how it happened so i don't know as an act my experience as i remember it my experience was i was surrounded with a great cast i don't know mm -hmm. that was the that i was always amazed by all of them and i was a sponge to, to all of their um, oh, totally. uh, vices and stuff like that. So I don't know, that's that's where I take from that. But uh, I don't know, maybe I'll have some experience in that. But uh. Well, you learn so much just watching people, working with other people. I mean, my God, I, I mean, even with, I learned from Brooke, I learned from PJ, I, looked from, I learned from Adrian, I learned from, learned from Mark and, you know, it was, Fan, it was just fantastic to see, especially like Adrian, right? Like she's a legend. She's this legend. And to watch how differently she works than maybe I do or, you know, Brooke does or something like that. It was it's such a gift. It, Diane, you're right. It's like, 
you soak it up from people around you. That's how I lived it. So mm. thank you, John, for... Uh, of course. I mean, you, you mentioned casting directors, Erica. I'll just hop in and say thanks to our um, amazing casting directors, Becky Silverman and Lisa Zambetti. That's how we got these three fantastic um, actors in the film. And, um, you know, Dorota and I reviewing tapes and watching um, reels. Um, you know, you could just... I mean, what we were looking for was was depth and an understanding of the multifaceted characters that they were going to play, and um, we got that emotion, and you you saw it in their eyes. Um, you know, I I can't imagine what what actors go through. It's the, it's like the most frightening thing for me to imagine, like bearing your soul. Um, and yeah, they they just brought these characters to life and. I'm going to tear up just thinking about it. <laughs> As a viewer, this is the first thing I said to John after watching it. The cast is... So, I'm a bit of a fanboy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank well, you. there is a question. This is a question for John, actually, that came through um, in our Q&A from Michael Guillen, or Gillen. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce your name, Michael. My apologies. How can you, uh, how can you see the Q&A? How does it work? Well, it's just for me. Oh, I, can I see, see it. it. You, you can't see it. If you're a panelist, can you can see it. Okay, maybe you can see it then. It would be at the bottom of your screen under Q&A. Oh, yeah, okay, I see it. <laughs> All right, is it, is it a French name? How would you say that? Uh, in French, I would have said Michel Guillon. Okay. And that's what it is. <laughs> then that's what it is. <laughs> okay, so this perfect question... English, so I am not sure about that. All right. There's so, a question there yeah that's what Erica yeah, was so getting I'm to. getting there I'm getting to the question so <laughs> yeah, right? Easy. Yes. so just everybody there's a Q&A uh, button at that's the right. bottom of your screen so if you have a Q and a, a question for anyone on the panel um, type it in and it looks yeah. like we might have some in the chat too we do so I'm gonna read Michael's question because Michael actually wrote one of the most insightful reviews of unearth um, Speaking that, uh, of bringing me to tears. I know. <laughs> so this question is for you, John. Um, so try oh not to cry, but it's All a great right. question. So the theatrical poster for Unearth is stunning. Can you speak to the process of creating a theatrical poster for a film? And how did you collaborate with Christopher Shy to come up with the concept? It's rich with feminist subtext. Oh yeah, man, I love, I love our poster so much. <laughs> Um, so Christopher Shy um, came across his work, I think originally, maybe from the Mandy poster, um, the Nicolas Cage um, film that came out a couple, two, three years ago, and just started looking at his work. He, he's called, he goes by Studio Ronin as well. Um, he also did like the... Um, Godzilla King of the Monsters like poster. I mean, he's done some huge, amazing shit. And so just on a whim, looking at, looking at his work because um, it felt like it was based uh, like in watercolor, um, which I thought, you know, thematically, we, you know, we're talking about contaminating, um, you know, aquifers and, and things of this nature. Water is a very key part of the story. So I love that. And I just love the style. Um, and I do consider our film kind of a throwback to like the thing, um, and, and films of that nature. And he had also done posters, um, for those films. So yeah, I just sent him a message. I just thought, you know, which was the case with a lot of things with unearth. I'm like, this guy's way out of our league. I'm just going to send him a message. Why not? What the hell? Uh, and I was like, man, your work is amazing. Uh, we're making this, you know, fracking horror movie. Um, would you be interested in talking about it? And yeah, we, we jumped on the phone. We emailed for a while. Um, talked about, uh, you know, some of the themes, sent him some, um, some visual references that uh particularly i connected to in the uh in the script and really just sent him the script um 
and let him kind of do his own thing, really, to be honest. Like, he's he's at such a level that Droden and I didn't want to micromanage him at all because he's an, he's an artist. And, um, yeah, the, the theme that he went with and the three um, generations of women, um, which I know, uh, I believe Michael commented to in his uh, deep analysis of our film, which I highly recommend every everyone check out. Um, yeah, so the symbolism is there. I, I, I like the three generations of women because women, um, are so important to the story and honestly, the, the future of the planet and, and the species, uh, in our survival, I think that, um, yeah, I, I, I won't, I mean, it would be great to maybe have Christopher do one of these at some point and, I get it, get into it, but um, I think it's all there in the poster, and and thank you for appreciating it. And actually, we're working to um, have an online store where people can buy the poster. And I can tell you, oh, like wow. the one sheet looks amazing on a wall. Oh, the wow. the colors like just pop. So I want one. Oh, you guys are all gonna get one, of course. Yay! So. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We'll think about it. Yeah, we'll have to send a shipment to France. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you just promised. Thank you for the question. Well, John, uh, this is another question for you from Lisa on the Q&A. Um, what is your writing process? So I know that you were really inspired um, to write about fracking. Um, mm. And it, I mean, the whole horror movie is about that and it goes way beyond. Um, uh, movies like Triple Divide and Invisible Hand, um, screening this week actually, um, really open up this issue. And and um, how does it how did it inspire you to to even write the script? And then what was your writing process like? Hmm. Okay, <laughs> good question. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so this one honestly came from a real place of anger and frustration, I, ha I have to be honest. Like, um, you know, they're all deeply personal, like um, Schism, the, the first feature that I wrote um, was from a place of anger and just complete sadness. And uh, yeah, and this one, it was about just being so pissed off <laughs> at, at uh, you know, industry putting profit over people. Mm -hmm. um, and things like that. So that's where it came from and the references, you know, that Erica made. Uh, I'll add Josh Fox's Gasland as well. So seeing these documentaries, um, yeah, and wanting to put that into a story that, um, you know, literally bashes your skull in with uh, wake up, <laughs> screaming wake up <laughs> was kind of mm -hmm. uh, the initial starting point. But the the writing process started in uh, January of 2013 because I looked <laughs> recently for Q&As to refresh myself. So um, January of 2013, I started bouncing some ideas off of... Um, some friends, Mark Kosabucky and Dave Bostaff, who um, were, were ran some uh, film festivals out this direction back in the day, because I knew they were huge genre fans. So um, some of the, the most memorable uh, imagery in the film were on these notes from January of 2013. Like I want a scene that shows this and I, I will not say what they are because um, <laughs> they would be heavy plot spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and just bouncing those ideas off of them and basically getting their reactions of like, oh shit, I have never seen that before. Do that, please, you know? <laughs> like and once I knew that like I was kind of passing uh, the, the test of like, you know, hardcore genre people, uh, you know, that kind of inspired me to like, okay, it, it's going to have, you know, this message, it's going to show some things we haven't seen before. Um, and then it was kind of like charting out each actor, um, each character, 
and um, kind of writing little stories. And actually, I probably sent some, and Brooke, that's probably what you're referencing. Um, you know, it's kind of giving a little like um, insight for myself on, on each character um, and just keeping that in the back of my mind because it's essentially like you're writing with seven or eight voices in your head um, and you want them all to, I mean, I wanted them all to feel lived in and multi-dimensional and complex. Um, so it was really a lot of time outlining and working things out. And then it came to, um, and if this is Lisa Knight, she was one of my uh, early, okay, was it? <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> so Lisa Knight's a screenwriter. Um, people who are, her, are writers um, and that I thought could really give me some great uh, insight if I was on the right path I would share like early drafts with um, to get their feedback and I probably over the course of like two to three years had um, probably 10 different readers uh, and they were extremely important in um, shaping the story I won't make this story 20 minutes long I promise so then going from there um, you know, once Mark and Allison came on board, uh, when we were doing the Kickstarter and the proof of concept, um, also it was very important getting um, their insight into their characters and the story as a whole. Um, and then, you know, realizing that I'm a white male and there's a lot of um, women voices in this story, um, bringing Kelsey Goldberg uh, into the process um, for the last probably year, year and a half of working on the script uh, up until, you know, we started production to really make sure that um, it rang true, all of those aspects. So I hope that answered the question in there. <laughs> I think Lisa would be satisfied, yeah. Okay, great. So there's another question from the Q&A from Mike. Uh, question for the panel. So what key lesson do you think you all took away from this filming this film on earth? And what did you carry with you to your other projects? Ooh. Some deep, <laughs> some deep thought on that one, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I took a class one time and somebody, well, never, it doesn't matter. Okay. Anyway, um, I learned that, I mean, I learned a lot about the, the pace of working on a, on a film, a feature in a short amount of time. Um, I learned about self-care, what's really important and how to, how to treat treat myself and what, what I, I don't mean treat yourself, but I mean how to take care of myself. Um, uh, because I, I got a really good sense of what I needed to be able, what, what I personally needed, what my body, what my mind needed to be able to do that job and do it well for, for John and for the people that I was working with. So I learned that. Um, what else did I learn? I learned, um, I learned that, uh, to, to trust my director. I learned that, uh, if you're in good hands, you can, you're capable of a lot more than you, than you think you are. Um, so definitely those things have carried over. I learned uh, that when you bring two dozen Krispy Kreme boxes for the crew, you really make their day. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody remember that? Yeah. <laughs> There was one right outside the hotel, and I, and I was like, you know, those guys are working their butts. I'm going to bring them some Krispy Kreme. And we <laughs> bought two dozen and just was just handing them out, and they were like, oh, thank you, BJ. So that was a good lesson to learn, to take with me. Good man. But, um, <laughs> I would definitely say... Um, Each project, especially this one, um, learning to trust your instincts because your instincts will 
take you in the right direction. But sometimes when you haven't done that enough or you, you just haven't had an opportunity to go from a film to a film to a film, some of us don't, you know, um, you get to learn that and take that to the, to the next one. And also the experience working with the director, but uh, I definitely think that's something I definitely learned is that uh, I re almost like you would just relearn it again or, or just gets more punctuated that uh, just follow your instincts. Um, you know, oh, and the, the third thing is that every film shoot is never going to go the way it's supposed <laughs> to go. And there's going to be challenges and they're just going to be different. And I remember this one scene real quickly, we're trying to do these prosthetics and it's raining and, and they're trying to go and, and Mark's trying to get everybody to go and everybody's getting pissed off, but, but, but John's just handling it. You know, he's just handling yeah. it. And, and back to John real quick, uh, a director who can keep their cool and because it all trickles down from them. And he did, man, he always mm -hmm. kept his cool. And there were some times it got crazy I well, good, had think, good help with Dorota. <laughs> with that? I said Dorota kept, kept me keeping my cool. That's good. <laughs> because uh, that's what kept my peace and sanity going through that was, was, was you, John. I mean, you were always so gracious and calm and like welcoming. Um, and you feel like a father. You feel like you're, you're, the, you're a father to us. And I think that is so important. So hopefully I can bring that to the next one and find that or just remember that or, you know, so. Well said. I'd second that about John and Dorota. Always keep, I don't think I ever saw you guys in, oh, in worry or freak out. And it could be raining. There might be a pony or a cow in a shot or something. <laughs> going on. And John and Dorota are like, this is just the way it is. And, and it does, it trickles down to everyone and it sets a tone for the whole, the whole cast and crew. Um, I feel like as a person, I learned about the world and the current state of our environment. Like I learned so much regarding that. And then as an actor, um, just bravery and like what PJ said, trusting your instincts. And they always tell you in acting class to commit, but like I learned that in a different way. <laughs> Um, I really experienced um, how important that is. So, learned so much. Yeah. Well, we have a few other questions. Uh, they're pouring in. So, uh, <laughs> one one is <laughs> one is Jerry who made a comment that PJ makes Jerry. a killer iced coffee to go with those donuts. You're getting props <laughs> from Jerry on that. Your iced coffee skills. Jerry. Can we just say that Jerry wardrobe? Yes. Jerry is incredible. She's amazing. She took such good care of all of us and she just the it's mind boggling to keep up with everybody's costumes and what state of distress they were in and shooting out of order and who I mean this isn't a spoiler who's got blood on them and where and I mean <laughs> it like does this is this bloody I mean it Jerry's amazing. Yep. And that's another thing I felt was in these smaller films, everybody starts to pull together. Everybody starts to do the best they can to help each other, bringing the donuts, doing this, bringing, that, bringing her a nice mm -hmm. coffee. It becomes this family. When it becomes this family, everybody's invested and everybody does their best and, and it doesn't feel like there's some hierarchy or bullshit and everybody's pulling their weight. And that's, to me, that yeah. is the, that's collaboration in every yeah. sense of the word. And that's the most important, I think, for a successful film shoot. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Well, Jerry just said she's deeply humbled and she's. <laughs> Jerry she's, saved our asses. So. Saved all her. Yeah, well, she did save her. <laughs> all right. We have a question from Stella, who is also a screenwriter, uh, to Monica, Brooke, and PJ. What draws you to a character? What do you look for in a part? Mm. Brooke? I was going to say Brooke. <laughs> I, I kind of already mentioned it a little bit, but um, just the complexity of this character and like so dynamic. There's, and I, I mean, I don't always get that opportunity. Those kind of characters don't always come through, especially at my age. And so, I mean, Kim, like I said, there's just so much to work with. 
I was intimidated a little, but I was like, well, you know, John Derodar trusting me. So I just went for it. Um, so I'd say like any sort of layers or that that's the dream. We don't always get that, but like that opportunity, but that's the dream is to be able to work with a really complex character. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I always, I mean, we're always trying to get cast and audition and hopefully get cast, but you do get excited mm -hmm. when an audition or a job brings you something that is, like Brooke says, very dimensional, three-dimensional if you want to go there, but very honest uh, on the page. There's a real person there on that page, you know, you can feel their heart beating. You can feel it. That's exciting. That's it was exciting when I first started acting, and it's even more exciting when you read it in any genre. Um, you know, is 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 real uh, brilliant writing that really exposes the human condition in some way, form, or another. Honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. To PJ. It, he's he's right on the money I, I think that you know we see we get auditions a lot of times for things that I mean, you do it and you do your best and you hope that you book it because it's a job but you know often you get a script and you're like oh. you know they're just one-dimensional or they're stereotypical but not you know not in a fun way or um so you do get excited like pj said sometimes when you when you get something and you're like oh I mean, I would, do, I would do my best regardless, but this is, you know, Aubrey in particular is such a good role. Like you really, like, you try not to get excited about auditions. At least I try not to get too excited about them, right? Because like, yeah, who, be who the hell yeah I guess you're just going to end up getting disappointed. It's but sometimes, yeah, 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 it's part of the job. And, but sometimes you get yeah. a script like this and you go, oh God, I really want this. Um, yeah, you care whether the people live or die on a yeah. page. Yeah. You know? And that's a brilliant yeah. thing to be able to write that. I, I, I'm in awe of that all the time when I read characters and I'm just like, I, yeah. thank you God for writing this. Yeah. I get to play it, I get to say these words. You know, uh, that's still the most exciting thing. It makes you look good as an actor too. Like it helps you out when that character's written. Yeah. And ready. For sure. There's some, there's some stuff that like, well, <laughs> that doesn't, I can't do much, you know, but this, these characters are so much to work with, so. Yeah. All right, well, here's another question. Um, PJ, so I understand that you came from Mindhunter to Unearth the next day. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Lisa, again, she's, yeah, she's curious, you know, what's the difference for you? What's the experience like coming from a big TV show or a studio film to working on Unearth? And the characters are totally different. Yeah, like, the characters are totally different. His Mindhunter character is so self-confident and Tom is in a totally different place. Now, is this about the experience they're asking? Well, yeah, I mean, how would you, okay, how would you compare well, I got an your experience? Oh, you okay? Go for it. I want to hear both. I want to hear both <laughs> yeah. both answers. Well, <laughs> David Fincher versus an eighteen-day feature film shoot. <laughs> David Fincher um, took you eighteen days. Yeah, we shot in eighteen days. David Fincher shoots like a take in eighteen days, like, <laughs> like a scene in eighteen. Yeah, it took us almost a month to shoot an episode, so I had to come back because we. When I came back, we spent fourteen hours shooting one scene. Wow. <laughs> Even the, even the uh, AD was like, okay, we're doing another close-up on the pencil. <laughs> 50 takes. And then I, I, I was like out of my head. And I had to smoke in one scene. So we went like three or four packs of cigarettes because uh. you light up, cut, you bring in another one, light up, cut. And that wasn't even director Fincher directing. 
because the guy said to me, wow, if Fincher would have been directing, he would have smoked a carton. Oh, <laughs> oh man. So, um, so at that point, you don't feel, you just feel like they're, they're just, they're just taking you and, and squeezing you as much as they can and then squeezing you as much as they can. And then they go in the editing room and they just go, ah, okay, we got all this to mess with. Whereas John's film, I was so happy to come, not dissing Mindhunter, like it's, it's an animal, it's huge. It's like $200,000 a day, it's insane. Um, really, I love that. The, the soundstage is as quiet as a mausoleum because everybody wears pads on their shoes because he likes it quiet, you know, which is kind of interesting. Um, you could lick the floor, it's so clean. Uh, but but coming back to, to, to John's film was like, you're coming to this personal story, you know, and uh, it's just, it's such a, I couldn't wait to get to Unearth. And when I left Unearth, I wanted, I couldn't wait to go back. You know, I, I, not that I didn't enjoy Mindhunter, it's a whole different animal, but you're just a piece in this small kind of wheel. Whereas in John's, you feel, you just feel so much more connected to, closer to the nucleus of the story. You feel more connected to, I don't know, to, part of the team, uh, if you want to say, you know? You feel like a smell of family. Mm. You really do, right. you feel like a family. And everybody on that shoot, uh, all you guys, like I, I just uh, loved everybody. And, and, and that's a great feeling when you're just, you're just a team. Everybody's committing and everybody's doing their best and you all want the same thing. And there's nobody pulling any crap because they're a bigger star or nothing like that. It's mm. just, everybody's just, it's just a beautiful thing. And you, and uh, yeah. All right, well, family, uh, there's David Fincher, right? And then there's John C. Lyons and Dorota. So what was it yeah. like working with John as a director? Of course, he's very compassionate and very composed, but what were John's little quirks that you noticed? And Dorota's, we can't and leave Dorota off the hook. <laughs> oh. Gosh, I don't remember anything specific. <laughs> I just remember like that that they were both just incredibly encouraging and supportive, and and it, it, we there was just an undeniable feeling that they believed in us, and so because they believed in us, we wanted to do the best possible job we could do, and. You know, I think PJ said it before, like you just feed off each other. You, you know, it's, if you've got a good director, if you've got somebody at the helm who, you know, is taking care of you, then um, this yeah. makes your job so much easier. But I can't think of anything specific. I know that um, Dorota is, um, she, she is like a goth supermodel is what I said a little while ago. She's like this stunning person you know when she talks to you you're like okay yeah. <laughs> whatever you say <laughs> whatever yeah, whatever you say um, yeah, but I had a wonderful time what was that PJ she has such an intensity to her mm -hmm. um and her knowledge about lenses and, oh. and the, you know just framing all that stuff was fascinating Mm -hmm. to talk to her about you know and and because she wouldn't yeah. talk that much but when she did yeah. um it's like you got to be prepared to talk to her because yeah. uh, if you're not you just step aside if you don't know if you're in, <laughs> you know because she's like you know um she doesn't bullshit around they're just mm -hmm. you know <laughs> i'm the bullshitter yeah for sure <laughs> <laughs> okay um well i think going back to the, i don't know if john has any quirks it's just uh um john had this calmness that I, I think i talked to you about it a lot and a calmness but a but a groundedness and boy that is a great feeling to have because anytime i had a question about character or anything like that john would even if he was busy he would he would you would say, oh, can I, can I get back to you on that? 
or if he was, because you'd forget that this guy's directing the movie. <laughs> hey, John, I got a question. He's like, I'm on like 50 million things right now. You know, you forget. <laughs> like, oh yeah, that's the director. He's got a million things going on in his head every day. But like I said, he was always calm and kind and, and, and interested in your questions and, and, uh, and just, that's a fucking beautiful thing, man. Mm -hmm. Beautiful thing. Because a lot of actors are very fragile people and uh, yeah. they, they have questions, they have concerns, they have insecurities. And um, just, he just guides you. He, you feel like he's holding you, you know? And that is just, boy, I tell you. I probably told you this then, but glad I fooled you because I was going <laughs> fucking crazy in my head. <laughs> well, there you go, man. But you knew how to step up and, and, and you know, reserve it, you know? Mm -hmm. But Still then when you put out, and then I understood you. And I'm like, oh, okay, now, now, now I know how events. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's think about your audience now. So everyone that just watched your film, that watched it uh, last week when it premiered, um, how do you think that your, your audience responded to a film that had this... Um, you know, kind of message of, of eco horror, you know, the, with the fracking theme. Um, do you think that that inspires the audience or do you think that, um, do you think that it um, gave them a different perspective on the world or it just kind of was like, no, nah, that's just another horror movie. Oh boy. <laughs> this is a, and so you obviously the Fantasia audience is the only one really that's seen the film to this point. So um, you're saying to comment to like um, the response we're seeing so well, far? Yeah, I mean, so what we would like the response to be or? <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's a good point. So this, this question came from JJ. I don't know if uh, I don't know if Diane reads his reviews, but it can it can be a, a downward spiral that you don't you don't want to <laughs> enter necessarily all the time. <laughs> well, that's critics, but I mean your your horror genre audience. Um, how do you think it's received to talk about for a film to have a an eco horror approach that you're talking about a real thing? and the dangers of this real thing um, on Americans, on anyone around the world where fracking is occurring. Right, yeah, I mean, you know, we're in a climate emergency and the world's on fire and <laughs> it's around us um, and we're starting to normalize it. So that's kind of like, you know, my, I, I think the, fi the film coming out now is interesting because, um, and I think I talked to, Diane about this as well it's like you know when when your film comes out to have it premiere during a pandemic it's like oh of course you know like I was looking forward to the film festival experiences like he's he's had with his like going and like I'd be loving having a having a drink with all these guys and everybody that's um you know seeing the film and uh, of course on earth comes out when we can't get together i mean it just makes perfect sense with how <laughs> challenging the seven year ride has been um but really like i think you know now we're in a situation of we're, we're living in this crisis and you know it's like we're getting to a point where it's like oh it's just another category five or oh it's just another massive fire or drought or the ice caps or it, it's the new hottest month on record like every month of every year <laughs> and it's like you know d denial should no longer be should no longer receive an ounce of time in the conversation. It's wasting our time. <laughs> so now you're getting me fired up. Okay. <laughs> so, this is back to why making, making this film, right? So, um, you know, beside the point that I think our, our leadership needs an exorcism to uh, <laughs> comment to Diane's film, like to purge, purge the leadership of, of, our country especially of um you know this corruption, <laughs> <I loved it. laughs> corruption and bullshit that, 
being <laughs> fed every day. <laughs> okay, I just want to add something as a as a viewer. Uh, you've have been reviews just from from the screening in Fantasia, right? Yeah, just from Fantasia. Well, and it's fans and it's critics, you know. So yes, I get that, but I don't know what what it was exactly because you sounded like it wasn't that positive, but. As much as I respect and love the viewers and the fans of Fantasia, I think that your film will find a true place in other, maybe more um, conventional festivals. I really, truly think so. Because the horror part, even though ah, I'm not, uh, I, it's not like I know anything, but as a, as a viewer, and I, I know a little bit what I'm talking about, I'm sure it will find a, a, an audience and a, uh, Maybe a, um, uh, because the subject is that serious and it's treated with a genre point of view, it will make a, an impact, I think. I truly Yay, think Yay, so. thank you. Thank yeah, you. thank you very much. Uh, and, um, yeah, apologies for my, my rant there and ramblings, but <laughs> no, I mean... I understand that because uh, <laughs> I will just give you an example, but when we were in, uh, in uh, Gérard we we won the, the, the biggest prize that gave that the jury gave to us. The thing is, like yeah. a little bit like on Earth, the book is not exactly a horror film. Even though it's about exorcism, it's not a, really a horror film. There's no jump scares. And, and I understand as a, oh, I, en I really enjoy a horror film. And if I, if that was what sold to me, like you're gonna watch horror films and then I watch the book, I would be a little disappointed. And I understand <laughs> that, um, um, in the audience, there were some disappointments, like, oh my God, this one was way better because he had blood in it and, and, and popping eyes and stuff like that. And I completely understand and respect that. But we found uh, an audience also outside of the genre hardcore fans community. Mm -hmm. And I think that this will be the exact case for On Earth. Okay. That's, yeah, that's, that's a good great. point. And I, I, you know, and, and obviously it, there's... Also, I saw that it was... Uh, f um, it, it all started, it, I don't know how it started exactly, but it's a Kickstarter movie and that's just, that's awesome. It means that you already have some kind of a fan base already made also. And I mean, not the movie itself, but the story around it is fascinating, I think. So I've read a little bit here and there and I think it, it deserves to get a greater audience and I'm pretty sure it will. And I give you my benediction as a as a Ooh. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. It it means a lot. And yeah, I I wasn't saying that. Um, yeah, I know horror horror. There's horror um, fans that definitely will will appreciate the film. I feel like it's it's a horror story based in in real life. Um, yeah. So you're right. Some some people rate horror just based on how many jump scares uh you know every 10 minutes and yeah. how much blood and guts but there's definitely um there's definitely genre fans that oh, yeah, um, also appreciate story <laughs> but yeah so we'll <laughs> see so yeah. it's, it's a mixed bag a movie than a, than a yeah. horror film as i saw it so yeah Dorota and i um we're expecting um mixed reaction and honestly i don't know how you all feel that are on the panel but really um the films that kind of stick to my brain like peanut butter on the brain um the most are ones that challenge me and um push some some buttons um and they may not be my favorite films they may not be the films that i'll rewatch over and over and over again mm -hmm. but damn if they don't make an impact and uh you know, stay with me. So maybe they're not a 10, but like some of the most memorable ones, maybe I can't even like give a, you know, a five star rating to or something, you know, it's beyond ratings. It's kind of like the nuance, right? It's, that's, that's what gets you. I agree with that 100%. So hard when you just give a rating, it's like, well, you got to break that rating down to what, you know, you can't just, <laughs> when you just said nuances and, and, and things, I think that is, key man because i've walked away from some things going i don't know if i like the film but man there were moments that rocked me so you know what what can i say do i want to watch it again i don't know but 
definitely I've had that experience many times, many times. Do any of you have a movie that you can think of that is kind of panned or didn't get great reviews, but you think is awesome or stuck with you? I have one. It's a bad one, but I loved Constantine with Keanu Reeves, and I know it's not a good film. I like Constantine I, too. I love it, I've, and and I don't. I I've watched it a few times, obviously, because I had to do the book, and it's really inspired from it. But it's I know I know it's not a good film. <laughs> I know I know it's not good, and I know it's not perfect at all. And 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 Keanu Reeves doesn't act as great as he's in other films. Maybe I don't know, but. I know it's a bad film, but as BJ said, some scenes just rock me, really move me. So yeah, I would rate it five, but some <laughs> scenes and some stuff, details in it just, so yeah. I own Constantine. I take offense. <laughs> yeah, well, well. I'll watch it after this. I've never seen it. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. You have a blast. It's a, it, it's really enjoyable. But yeah, yeah. it's ridiculous. It's, it's great. ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyone else? I mean, I would say any like um, Mikel Haneke movies or um, like Requiem for a Dream, like movies that mm. like blow me away. But I'm not gonna like watch funny games every other day you know? I think that's what Michael Anneke wants you yeah, they, they blow you away and doesn't want much, you to love them they blow you away in that but it's not shock value in a sense it's 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 so disturbing that you don't know if you can bear watch it again but it taught you something you can't mm. quite figure out what it's teaching you but it's teaching you something like, <gasps> it changed something up here, and I'm Absolutely. never getting that back. <laughs> That's a lot of guts to do that as a filmmaker, you know. And I, my hats off to him. And then filmmakers like that—they take the guts to reveal something. And plus, uh, Bernstein can't yeah. even—it's hard to watch that performance without just crying my eyes out. It's just like. My God. Woo. What a second. <laughs> Got any other ones for us? I remember, well, I mean, my favorite. Oh. <laughs> you go. Brooke. Brooke. John, you had me watch The Witch as an inspirational film. <gasps> I love The Witch. <laughs> 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 And that was one of those that I was so disturbed, like I'm not gonna watch again. But it was like, whoa, and beautiful, very unique and different. Oh, so pretty. Not a man with a chainsaw running around chasing teenagers. You know, it's very different, but very disturbing. As my girlfriend said, You're I would look at a goat the same way. What is she? <laughs> I would never look at a goat the same way. Oh. Yeah. Is it Black no, Peter? What was his name? about this because the the witch was one of my main is, inspirations you you obviously and i felt that in on earth as well it was a, a real inspiration you know what's funny is this takes me right back to the question of what do you learn sometimes that you can take with you and here's a perfect example sometimes the people you're working with on something so small you never know where people are going to go and my prime example is I worked on a short back in 2007 about a gambling addict, or was it 2008? And the cinematographer was named um, uh, Jaron Blotchke, okay? And this guy took his time. I mean, he was meticulous, but the shots were crazily beautiful. Well, watch The Witch years later, and I'm looking at this going, God, every frame is like a painting. And then I'm in the theater with my girlfriend watching uh, The Lighthouse, oh, yeah. shot beautifully, mm -hmm. cinematographer, Jaron Blotchke. And I was like, and we walked out of the theater in New York City, I was like, holy shit, that's Jaron. I worked with him <laughs> on a little short in Vegas in 2008, and he was genius. So I got so like, 
happy for him and happy that like these films I've been talking about that are just beautiful that this motherfucker shot him. I was like, oh my gosh. That's cool. And sometimes the crew was like, DJ, can you just tell him for us that you're gonna walk in five minutes if he doesn't have this shot? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> man. Because I knew I had an artist in front of me. Like he was taking his time, but man, when you see the frames of this movie, you're like, this guy, and how do you deal with that on a set? How do you deal with that? Like, you know, a guy is creating art here. You, you, you want to rush because you got time commitments, but at the same time, you're like, how do you balance that? You know? Anyway. Yeah. So there I want to just give a quick shout out to Una Lee, our DP. Oh, yes. She's, she's amazing. Yeah, mm. and worked her ass off. Oh, yeah. There was a time where we thought we weren't going to get this shot and it needed two cameras and and she just said, no, we get it, we get it. <laughs> Remember that? And I was like, this woman's a badass. Wow. <laughs> badass is right. You put that here, you put that here, you put that here, and, it, and, and we're losing time. And, and boy, there you go. Talk about people you want in the trenches with you. Yeah. All right, well, speaking of um, the people that you meet and then you don't know where they're gonna go, Brooke, where do you see yourself in five years? Oh gosh. Um, Hopefully in more movies with us. <laughs> yes, that's what I'll say. I'm glad you're answering that question. Yes. This goes to everyone involved in under. <laughs> Hopefully more movies with us. Um, I'd say more film experience, just like continuing to broaden my, um, my acting experience. And like, uh, I, I, if I can say that I've play, played a range of different characters, I'll be really happy. Um, Wow. And, and Unearth is one of those that allowed me to do that. It's not something that I typically play. Um, and so I think I'd be really happy if like, when I'm old, I can say that I, I played a lot of, a range of different people um, and, and understood and put myself in a, a lot of different people's shoes. I definitely see you doing that. Mm, yeah. yeah. Thank you. For sure. What's your dream role? Or who's um, the actress, maybe, or actor that you aspire to the most? I love so many, like, I love, like, Reith, Reese Witherspoon and, like, a bunch of actors in, like, romantic comedies. <laughs> and then I love someone like Sarah Paulson and, like, uh, oh, yeah. Charlize Theron, like, so incredible. Margot Robbie. Um, I feel like they, they get to play some really awesome characters that have a lot of depth and um, and they play a range of characters. Um, and so I, that would be a dream kind of career, obviously. But, mm -hmm. yeah. This is another question from Lisa. So Monica, you taught theater. Are you still teaching? Oh yeah. Um, no, right now. Well, I don't think anybody's teaching anywhere right now. <laughs> no, um, I, I was. I was teaching uh, movement and a little bit of acting here and there, but uh, I haven't been a classroom teacher for a, a long time. I used to teach middle school and high school theater and college theater. This is all in South Carolina. So, but I'm not right now. No. It's fun. Well, I have dreams about it. Dreams about teaching? Yeah, I wake. I have dreams all the time that I'm back in the classroom and I've been gone for a long time and I don't know where anything is. And um, anxiety dreams. Oh um, shit! I'm so I've got tons of those. Um, anxiety dreams. Anxiety, anxiety. dreams. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you know. don't have those, PJ? I have them all the time. I have them every morning. Yeah, I have them, like <laughs> I'm having one right now. <laughs> yeah, but no, I'm not teaching right now. All right. Yeah. I have, a, have so, an eight-year-old son, so it, I'm, I'm teaching him. Your hands him. are full. Yeah. Okay, so John, what is the future for Unearth? The future is um, we're the opening night film of the Hardline Film Festival in Germany in a little <laughs> under a month, which is great. It's actually like three weeks. Holy crap. Yeah. Um, and we're set to play uh, Grim Fest in uh, Manchester coming up in October. Um, we just signed uh, independent or international sales with real suspects. So um, they're, uh, you know, working to get us in, in more film festivals and 
in front of eyeballs overseas. Um, and yeah, we're, you know, there's, <laughs> we're, we're still working on America and uh, America <laughs> and um, <laughs> figuring out uh, what, what's, what's going to go on here. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, we'll see. We'll see, but we're going to, we're going to blow it up as, as big as we can and get it in front of as many eyeballs as, as possible. Um, yeah. Yeah. So when you can get every, when you can go into a theater again, hmm. uh, can we, are you going to have a big <laughs> premiere here in Erie and is everyone going to come back and we'll have that I, drink and party yeah, let's, <laughs> and celebrate let's have a, together? big premiere in Erie. Let's also go to New York. Let's also go to LA. Let's also go to wherever Brooke may be now. Uh, let's also go to France. Um, yeah. yeah. I can organize it if you All want. All right. Shit. <laughs> okay. We'll do the double bill again for real. Yeah, in real life. Forever. <laughs> yeah. Gary says yes, yes, yes. <laughs> awesome. Go to unearthmovie.com and sign up for our newsletter to keep informed. How about that oh, little that's plug? A great way Squeeze to that in oh, there. Yeah, How nice. <laughs> can I see Diane's film? I'll send you a link. I'll, I'll, uh, I've, I've, um, John, I've sent you a link, right? Yes, I can share that with the cast and crew, but what about everybody on the Q&A? Is there plans um, to have it available somewhere publicly or? Uh, somewhere publicly, only on Shadows, but I don't know if it's uh, available outside of France. Well, shoot. So right now we're still on festivals. At some point I'll Oh, yeah, there. okay. So probably follow, um, you have a Vimeo page, yeah, right? I have uh, Instagram. Oh, okay. I follow our Instagram. I communicate a lot on Instagram. It's uh, dibuk, D I B B U K underscore film, F I L M. And um, yeah, I, I share a lot on, on Instagram about the life of the film. And you can oh. see uh, the different prizes that we won. And lately, someone made a wonderful fun art. And I have a, a, a little. Uh, a little doll of myself. Oh. Someone made that. <laughs> That's that, awesome. Yeah. That was great. I'm going to show you. you've made it when you're no, a doll. No, no, I won't show it to you. Just go on Instagram, D-I-B-B-U-K underscore film, and you'll see that yeah, there's yeah. a little doll of myself. <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. And this is a demon. This is crazy. Holy shit. Oh, man. That's what I took from the witch. Oh, go wow. Crazy. That's, shit. That's awesome. All right, everyone, we're going into fall. So one last question for you. Why are cornfields so scary? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> hmm. I mean, to me, when you're in a cornfield, to so talk about like isolation, when you're in the middle of a cornfield, everything is so close to you and you feel like so insulated and isolated but yet so intimately um connected to nature and you can hear like you know it's the sound of those um the stalks rubbing up against oh, each yeah. other and the subtlest yeah. of breezes and the birds flapping overhead i mean yeah there's quite there's an experience just walking by yourself through mm -hmm. a cornfield i don't know what does everybody else <laughs> think? You can hide in the cornfield so easily it's a great place to deal with your fear because you just walk into it and you just go, okay, I'm here. Whatever's going to come out, just come out, man. Come out now. <laughs> come. And then you realize nothing's there and you're like, all right, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. It's a good cleansing place to me. <laughs> <laughs> Monica, Diane? No, but I oh, Cornfield? Yeah. Um, it's... Uh, it's hard to find your way out, um, right? Um, they get scarier as as they die and get like withered and stuff. Because then, like corn corn mazes scare me. I, I don't. I'm not a big fan of corn mazes because I'm not exactly sure. I'm worried I'm not going to get out. I'll be that last <laughs> person in there. Yeah. Yeah. Reminds I just me saw of this like, 
the overlook like corn mazes remind oh me my god of, for like, sure the shining. Oh, for sure <laughs> Yeah, the hedge maze. Yeah, and then I also, yeah, I just saw this other film about, it's called like the tall grass or something. And it was like people lost in this grass. And I thought that reminds me of shooting on earth. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it signs. Oh, yeah. That's what I always think about. Mm. The movie signs where they make all of the crop circles. Right, and then the, right. They come in with the shimmery skin and oh yeah God. that was like one of the scariest movies I saw because I'm not a horror movie person at all but when uh -huh. I saw signs in the theater I drove home with my friends next to cornfields and we were like Ooh. gripping each other because we were so scared driving next to cornfields so mm -hmm. oh man yeah cornfields crazy scare me I don't think I ever saw a cornfield in real life Oh man, we gotta bring bring oh, you out here. What? We gotta have some screenings in the cornfield <laughs> or something. Yeah. They have cornfields. I don't think I don't think I ever saw one. Yeah, come on, that. Diane. We'll get drunk in a cornfield. <laughs> that that's what scares me. That's what that's why cornfields are scary. Getting drunk with PJ in a cornfield. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't smoke in a cornfield because you'll no. start That's what scares me most. If I couldn't hey. find a lighter, that, that's what scares me most. <laughs> that out. All right. Well, everyone, this has been awesome. Pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for everyone that's that's on the the webinar today for coming. That's been so exciting hearing from all of you about the film, and can't wait to see what's next with Unearth, and can't wait to bring you to Erie because I'm sure a lot of the people that are on this webinar will be very excited to to come to that screening too. So, thank sure. you all. For your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. It was nice Bye -bye. meeting you all. Yes. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you too. Bye.